His international bestseller is called When China Rules the World. I'll go one on one with author and academic Martin Jacques. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. Martin Jacques has never been shy about sharing his views, whether as a columnist or editor of various publications or as co-founder of his own think tank. And he's no stranger to academia as well. A sought-after lecturer, he's currently a senior fellow at Cambridge University and a visiting professor at Fudan and Tsinghua Universities in China. His book, When China Rules the World, The End of the Western World and the Birth of a New Global Order, is now in its second edition. Martin Jacques, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to have you in the studio. Now, of course, um, much has happened since the publication of that book back in 2009. Lots of transformation in China. What is your assessment of the changes that have taken place? Well, since then, I mean, I think the changes have been huge. Um, the first great change, of course, was the Western crisis, which changed the context. Secondly, um, China's economic uh, progress has remained considerable. Um, and uh, thirdly, the big shift in terms of China conceiving itself no longer primarily as an economic power, but also now seeking to define itself as a political, cultural, military, intellectual, moral force uh, in the world. And we see more of that, aren't we? Is China making its voice heard on uh, diplomatic platforms like the United Nations, uh, like at the G20? Yes, I mean, basically we've seen the end of the Deng Xiaoping era, which was essentially concentrating on economic growth, reduction of poverty, and foreign policy and so on essentially being uh, uh, the, uh, the aim of foreign policy was to create the best possible conditions to achieve those things. But by, by the financial crisis and certainly by 2012 with Xi Jinping, basically China had achieved what it could achieve under, the, under those circumstances. And so its whole mindset essentially broadened out uh, to becoming... Uh, establishing its place in the world in a completely new way. And that is the sort of rather invigorating uh, process we've seen over the last several years. Right, you have a unique perspective on China. You're from the West, but you've spent years studying China. You've lived there. Uh, what are some of the biggest misperceptions in the West about China and its system of governance? Well, unfortunately, the West cannot adjust in, uh, in a fundamental way, in my view, uh, to the rise of China. And the reason is because the West, you know, has essentially, you know, ruled the world, if you like, for the last 200 years or so. And the underlying assumption in the West is that to be modern, you have to be like us. We are the template. And the extent to which you're not like us is the extent to which you are failing. And that, I think, is the Western mentality. Now, China is not like that, and it's never going to be like that. So the West is uncomfortable, uneasy with the rise of China. It, 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 it finds it extremely difficult to make sense of China, uh, to understand it. And the result of this also is that it is unable to learn from China, and learning from China is going to become so important for the West. Right, because the conventional view is that uh, as you modernize, you become more Western. But you say that is not the case with China. Well, the, the mantra, the Western mantra certainly was, you know, modernization is synonymous with Westernization. And for a long historical period throughout the 19th century, probably up until the middle of the 20th century, with the exception of Japan, it was true. Because all mod successfully modernized societies were essentially Western societies. But that process began to change in the late 50s, 60s, uh, with Taiwan and South Korea and so on. And then, of course, a floodgates opened in East Asia, China, Malaysia, Thailand, lots of countries joined in uh, this process. And suddenly, you know, the countries that are modernizing are no longer simply Western societies, or not even primarily Western societies anymore. And in that situation, it's obvious. You know, modernity is not just a product of technology, competition, markets, a kind of neoliberal position. It's a product, uh, equally, of history and culture. And, these societies, but above all China, is 
fundamentally different in terms of its history and its culture. And therefore, you know, Chinese modernity is never going to be synonymous with Western modernity. How can it be? It can never do that. Just like, by the way, Japan has never been like that either. So you cannot look at China through a Western prism and help and, and hope to understand it. Because in a month of Sundays, you never will. Your book, When uh, China Rules the World, it's uh, an interesting book. It's a great read. I've read it. It's very accessible. Uh, there's some interesting terminology you use in that book. You describe China as a civilization state rather than a Western-style nation state. Uh, what do you mean by that, and how does it explain China's perspective? Well, I think this is absolutely fundamental to an understanding of China. I mean, everything changes with China. You know, when did history start? The West thinks history starts maybe 17th century, 16th century, but that's when it starts, or, or sometimes they, uh, it's slightly a moving feast, but something like that. Actually, historically, very recent. When does China start? China starts, what, as a united polity, 211 BC, with the victory of the Qin dynasty at the beginning of the Qin Empire and so on. That's 2,000 years ago. And China essentially was not a nation, it was not a nation state. It, was, it was only became a nation state at the end of the 19th century. It only began to acquire, acquire the sort of um, trappings, if you like, of a nation state at the end of the 19th century. 2,000 years, though, what has it been? It's been essentially, in my view, a civilization state. And the characteristics of that are that the way in which the Chinese see themselves is defined by that experience of civilization. So you can't understand the Chinese state and its relationship with the people. You can't understand a relationship rather than rules-based society. You can't understand um, uh, the, the, the nature of guanxi or um, family relationships uh, with regard to, or ethnicity with regard to China without understanding China as a civilization state. Now, this is absolutely fundamental. Opposite to the West, overwhelmingly the West, is essentially based on the notion of uh, national identity. Uh, uh, nation state. Whereas Ch for China, I think it's the most important thing is the civilizational legacy, the civilizational inheritance. Right. But here we have a country that is very diverse, very cosmopolitan in many respects. Uh, you make the point that unity is paramount in China. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> if you take the contrast between Europe and China, 2,000 years ago, Europe was united in the Holy Roman Empire. And then over a long historical period, essentially it broke up into lots of different units which we now call nation states. And that is still true. The European Union is secondary when it comes to the identity of Europeans. The first identity is a nation state. China, absolute opposite. 2,000 years ago, it was fractured into many different, during the warring state period, into many different units. Then a long historical process over 2,000 years of progressive unification. So the default mode for China is this huge country. The default mode for Europe are lots of these different nation states. What are the main political values in China? I would say unity, stability, order. Why is unity so important? Because the Chinese historical experience has been basically that the worst times have been when it's been divided. So and stability and order obviously go, the three of them go together. Now you'd never think of that in the context of Europe, basically. It doesn't think like that. It would never say the three most important political values to us are unity, stability, and order. Uh, so you can't make sense of China politically without seeing that historical span. Well, let's look at China right now. You write in the book that, quote, we stand on the eve of a different kind of world. You also say the rise of China will, quote, change the world in the most profound ways. Are we already seeing that? without any question whatsoever. I mean, the process started, oh, we, we can start with 1949, but let's start with 1978. I mean, since 1978, China's extraordinary rise uh, to the second largest economy uh, in the world. We've never, ever seen uh, anything like that um, uh, 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 previously. Um, but now, uh, you know, it's, let's say it's more or less on a par in many respects now with the United States. And so, China is now in a position to influence the world. And one of the most interesting that's happened over the last five years is the way in which China, from being you know, cautious, relatively passive, a bit of a spectator when it came to international matters, uh, debating you know, the global order and so on, 
Increasingly, China's become a maker uh, and a shaper of globalization, Belt and Road, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, and so on. Now, I think that uh, it's inconceivable that the rise of China will not transform, in the long run, the global order in the most profound ways. Because what we're moving from over the last two or three hundred years is a world dominated by the West. Today, what does it represent? 15% of the world's population? To a situation where China, along with the developing world, and I think the relationship between China and the developing world is critical, uh, which represents 85% of the world. So how can you have a global order which represents 85% of the world's population in a completely new way and carry on with the institutions, the attitudes and the values that grew up and were framed by a very small sliver of humanity in the West? So I think it is absolutely, in the long run, I don't expect, to be, honest, to be honest with you, much to remain of the existing institutions. In the long run, I'm not talking about the next year, five years, ten years, but looking in a decadal way in the future, we're, in, we're going to enter a profoundly different world. And in my view, there's no question this is an al unalloyed good thing. Because, you know, for the world to be run by 15% of the world's population for so long, it was an authoritarian global regime. The vast yeah. majority didn't have a say, but we're moving towards what I regard to be one of the greatest periods of democratization the world has ever seen in global terms. Right, you make the point in the book as well that for the first time we are seeing the developing world actually dictate the international agenda. Yes, I think this is very important. In fact, maybe we, we should think of China being part of this phenomenon rather than China and the developing world. It is the developing world since, see, since the, I mean, the great moment in a way, of, one of the great moments, in some ways arguably the most important moment of the 20th century was decolonization, colonial liberation, which swept, you know, until then there were very few nation states in the world. And this has allowed, um, uh, uh, created the conditions for so many countries, India is another absolutely crucial and critical example to find their, find their footing and express themselves in completely new ways. So I regard China to be part of that development rather than simply on its own plus the developing world. And I think that China's relationship with the developing world is the critical axis, if you like, for the development of China's influence. And if we want to understand what going to, the world's going to be like, it is about the developing world led by China. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB. So China's influence is growing. How is its economic influence changing the world? Well, <clears throat> you know, hitherto, essentially it's been um, quite low down in the value-added chain. Basically, cheap, pretty cheap labor, basic forms of production uh, for uh, export markets, but we've seen a, a, a really, a, 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 historically speaking, a very rapid transformation of the Chinese economy, so that it's already, you know, playing on a much higher plane, really, when it comes uh, to the products it's capable of producing. I mean, uh, maybe the most dramatic example of this is the way in which, in a very short space of time, China's created some formidable uh, tech companies. Uh, you know, nowhere else in the world apart from the Silicon Valley's managed to do this, and the Chinese have done it in a very short space of time. Um, and, um, you know, I think that in some ways China's already dancing on the edge of modernity, or the edge of modernity. If you look at, you know, WeChat, I mean, you know, people, I mean, I'm at Fudan University at the moment, and, you know, the students never uh, pay for anything anymore. I don't, I don't know whether they carry any cash with them because it's all offering your WeChat. On WeChat, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And, uh, um, and, you know, the bike sharing, fascinating development. I mean, these are in advance of anything in the West, and I think this will become more and more characteristic. I mean, when you think, it wasn't so long ago, people would say to you, ah, oh, but China will never be an innovator. Excuse me, it already is. Yeah, if you look at the <laughs> transport infrastructure in the country, I mean, it is by far, I think, the most advanced in the world. Yeah, I mean, come to America, I'm going back to the, you know, it's a third world country when it comes to transportation.